Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Chris Hoff and I am a full-time faculty at Cal State San Bernardino in the Counseling and Guidance program in the College of Education. Um, one of the classes I teach there is Addiction Counseling. I happen to be teaching that this semester. I also direct the nonprofit California Family Institute in Costa Mesa, where we are a community and counseling center. And my role there is as a clinical supervisor, uh, a director, a clinical director, and a lot of problems that we encounter there uh, involve substance misuse. And I also do a lot of consulting in the addiction treatment industry. I currently do some uh, clinical supervision for uh, addiction treatment. And I wanted to thank, I want to thank, before I get started, uh, Dr. Soto for inviting me to share with you some dominant models for understanding substance abuse uh, in the current um, scholarship or, the, in the, or in the field. And um, what I'm going to go over, I'm going to go over actually four perspectives, but the three main theoretical perspectives on addiction that have dominated contemporary substance abuse scholarship are going to include learning theories, biological theories, and goal-focused theories. Uh, whereas these models often guide treatment approaches implicitly in this section or in this kind of presentation, we will examine these influential models explicitly. Uh, so typically most practitioners in, the, in this field do not subscribe to one approach and instead often recognize several aspects of each model as informing the work they do or the approach they take. So these models you'll be introduced to, I think most people uh, kind of um, follow some aspects of all of them as they do the work. So we're going to start with learning and or drive theories, learning theories. And we'll start with learning theories, but learning theory pose, uh, takes the position that addiction arises because certain activities are powerfully rewarding and become more so through repeated exposure. So uh, whereas a behavior that is punished is li likely not to be uh, imitated, behaviors that are rewarded may be imitated depending on the characteristics of the behavior being observed and the consequences of the behavior. Uh, with respect to substance use, a person may experience peers or friends being positively rewarded for their substance use. Uh, for example, improved social connections, popularity, and then they may subsequently imitate and then repeat this behavior seeking those same things. Support for this theory includes evidence that non-human species can acquire addictive behavior patterns through repeated pairing of cues and reinforcers and that at least some human addictive behavior appears to show acquisition and extinction patterns predicted by operant and classical conditioning theory, and that some addictive behaviors appear to involve automatic habit mechanisms. A separate influential perspective related to learning theory is drive theory, which takes the position that addiction involves the development of powerful psychological drives underpinned by homeostatic mechanisms. For example, when a strong psychological need or drive for substances is satisfied, then the drive for the substance is reduced and the person returns to a homeostatic or relaxed state. Now, the drive theory paradigm tends to follow a particular sequence that occurs because a past experience, drug ingestion, followed by profound relief, for example, has now become associated with a primary drive state supporting the idea that problematic substance use can be treated as a learned behavior. Evidence for this theory suggests that the person struggling with substances experiences a re reinforcing pattern that gradually weakens the capacity to incorporate alternative learning strategies or responses. Because the consistent rewards of ingestion are more immediate than the destructive and alienating costs of problematic substance use, individuals trapped in the cycle will only enter treatment when confronted by overwhelming negative consequences, for example, hitting bottom, such as a spouse's threat to leave, a job intervention, housing problems, or legal uh, difficulties. So what are the implications for treatment? Uh, treatments guided by learning and drive theories generally focus on first, removing opportunities for potential addicts to reinforce their previous addictive behaviors, and second, loosening the associations between cues 
and rewards or cues and behavior or outright adding a punishment for the problematic behavior. All of these goals imply treatment by means of enforced abstinence. A typical cue exposure treatment involves repeated unreinforced exposure to stimuli previously associated with drug use in an attempt to extinguish the person's condition responses to such cues. This approach to substance abuse treatment has been very influential on Western treatment practices, currently dominated by the abstinent-only abstinent treatment uh, programs. Treatment most uh, treatment programs in North America you'll find are abstinent-only. This treatment model privileges interventions that prevent the development of acquired drives, mitigate the impact of other drives, or reduce the addictive drives acutely, acutely during attempted recovery assuming that the addictive drive states will subside eventually if the rewarding behavior does not occur. This technique has been used in treatments across most drugs of, abu of abuse, including opiates, alcohol, and nicotine. So what are the limitations to these theories? Well, one limitation of learning and drive theory is that these theories do not account for the role of the self-conscious intentions, desires, or beliefs that have been acquired through experience. A second limitation is that not all addictions appear to follow a pattern that suggests a need for homeostasis. And even addictions suggest, that suggest a drive mechanism also show evidence of other important influences. And finally, the underlying models of addiction gu guided learning and drive theories have been based on animal models that, that are themselves limited and have not generalized well to human experimental biology and clinical research. Perhaps as a consequence, treatment aim, treatments aimed at promoting recovery using cue exposure techniques have not proved successful to date. So that moves us to biological theories. Biological theories describe addiction as a brain disease in which mechanisms leading from an initial experimentation with drugs for positive reward to craving as a result of an increased cognitive wanting of the drug together with damage to executive and function, impair the capacity of addicts to engage in reflective, reflective self-regulation. This theory model has become quite prominent in the United States over the last decade, as the National Institute on Drug Abuse has proclaimed addiction to be a chronic relapsing brain disease caused by prolonged substance abuse uh, or substance use. This prominence is not unwarranted as a large number of clinical and laboratory observations have focused on the hypothesis that the primary neural substrates of persistent compulsive drug use are not homeostatic adaptions as described previously, but rather long-term associative memory process, processes occurring in several neural circuits that receive input from midbrain dopamine neurons. <coughs> Excuse me. So what are the implications for treatment? Well, biological theories argue that biochemical problems call for biochemical solutions. So as the perspective primarily motivates the development of medications to prevent the lows or block the highs of substance use, current addiction treatments include several pharmaceutical interventions such as tapered methadone, uh, tapered methadone plus adjunctive medication, other opioid agonists, clonidine and lofexidine, for example. Um, but methadine, methadone in particular has been shown to be effective, uh, effective maintenance therapy intervention for the treatment of heroin dependence as it retains patients in treatment and decreases heroin use better than treatments that do not utilize opioid replacement therapy. While showing a st statistically significant superior effect on criminal activity, meaning it reduces also reduces criminal activity. Agonist maintenance therapy is currently the recommended treatment for opioid dependence detoxification due to its superior outcomes. However, limited long-term efficacy and patient dis discomfort remain significant challenges. What are the limitations to this theory? Although shown to be effective, pharmaceutical interventions are underused in specialized substance abuse treatment. Much of the resistance to these interventions come from third-party payers, like insurance companies, some clinicians, uh, some patients and their families are opposed to these uh, interventions, and some individuals participating in self-help groups, like 12-step groups, for example, uh, can negatively view medications as substituting a pill 
for self-empowerment and self-responsibility. As with learning and drive theories, a major limitation of biological addiction models is their heavy reliance on animal models, which may not generalize well to explain the behaviors of addicted, free-living human beings who experience a complicated variety of influences and motivations. Finally, many social scientists have criticized the recent neurocentric discourse of substance abuse treatment as reductive and inattentive to individual values and social context. Some research suggests that combining pharmaceutical interventions with psychosocial support strategies, strategies that are tailored to meet the individual's needs may be the most thorough approach to facilitate the long-term behavior change that is necessary to treat opioid addiction effectively. So that moves us to goal-focused theories. Now, goal-focused theories propose that addiction arises out of pleasure-seeking or avoidance of distress or discomfort in other domains of an individual's life. Unlike learning and drive theories, goal-focused theories are typically agnostic regarding whether the inputs work through automatic or reflective processes. These models also differ from learning uh, or drive theories in that they hypothesize that addictive behaviors provide sought-after functions such as euphoria and pleasure or weight control and desired body shape. What are the implications for treatment? Well, goal focus is a consistent positive predictor of how clients will perform in addiction treatment. So counselors and therapists do what they can to help clients become motivated to move in a health-inducing direction. Treatment options from this perspective could involve blocking the pleasurable effects, uh, like using medication like opioid blockers, restricting access, bolstering countervail countervailing motivation, providing substitute sources of pleasure or the functions provided by the addictive behavior, and or boosting capacity and skills for self-control. What are the limitations here? Well, there's little direct evidence in humans linking the degree of pleasure from a behavior with its addictive potential. In some addictions, reports of the importance of functions of the addiction, such as weight control, are not predictive of success, of success at ceasing use. Because there is a belief that pleasurable effects are at play in goal-focused models, common prevention and treatment tactics from this perspective often involve coercive approaches and can be often pathologizing and shaming. Unfortunately, the data overwhelmingly show that these approaches are ineffective. On the contrary, studies find that the more autonomy and control people feel they have over the goals, over their goals, the more likely they are to succeed in tasks requiring self-restraint. I said we would cover an additional fourth theory, and that is probably the more, most prominent theory you're going to find currently, and that's the biopsychosocial spiritual model. And this is an integrative model beginning to dominate clinical and research discussions on addictions. And this is kind of an integrated model uh, that um, integrates biological, psychological, and social, psycho social explanations that are crucial for understanding substance use. Um, therefore, <clears throat> addictive behavior in this model is understood as a complex disorder um, multiply determined through biological, cognitive, psych psychological, and sociocultural processes. In this model, addiction appears to be an interactive product of social learning in a situation involving physiological events as they are interpreted, labeled, and given meaning by the individual. Um, so why is this important? Well, um, it's important to know these models because as a mental health professional, you can expect, in, like in a private practice setting, approximately, the research would show approximately 50% of your clients are probably touched by some form of alcoholism. They're either their own or a family members. Um, and, I, and I can, uh, if N equals one, I can, I can verify this in our work in our community counseling center for sure. Uh, a lot of people that come to see us uh, either have their own struggles or uh, are, have been touched by it in some family member in some way. And also, if you begin to work maybe in agency work, what have you, uh, or even in the criminal justice system, over 80% of persons incarcerated in the U.S. have a substance use problem upon emission. And uh, it is obviously, um, I think, common knowledge now that addiction problems are rampant 
across all areas in which social services are provided and where as a professional you'll find yourself probably throughout some point in your career uh, providing those kinds of services. So, uh, so there you have it. Those are our dominant models for treating substance abuse. My name is Dr. Chris Hoff. Once again, I would like to thank Dr. Soto, Soto for asking me to come and, and share these models with you. Um, and I hope that you found them helpful. Thank you.